Yeah, thanks very much for the kind introduction. Also, I would like to thank the organizers for setting up this uh, very nice workshop. Um, yeah, it's a pity that we cannot all be at the IPAM uh, physically, but um, yeah, I think uh, it's the best we can do for now. And, and yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a great workshop. So um, this talk will, talk will be about uh, deep learning and trying to get some understanding of, of uh, deep learning. So, so we already had some talks on this, this topic before. Um, also about implicit bias. Um, so Baba Kasibi talked about this and um, also there's relation to, to the talk of um, Fuang Wang. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so, so um, well, I don't think I need to introduce deep learning um, to, to you. So, um, uh, we all know it's it's a great tool and it has has led to an um, enormous number of, of breakthroughs in all kinds of applications uh, like um, yeah protein folding uh, autonomous driving and and and, and uh, face recognition and so on but um, despite all these successes it's uh, and uh, not really clear why all this works so well. So, I mean, we, we start getting some understanding, but, but there are many, yeah, um, uh, many question marks uh, still. So, uh, I mean, why does deep learning work? Uh, can we understand it? Um, and so the question is also, what can we prove about uh, deep learning? And uh, so there are several mathematical aspects and so in my talk, I will um, touch on the optimization part. So um, in particular, understanding gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent for learning neural networks. And also it touches about, upon generalization properties of deep neural networks. But there are many other aspects that are also important uh, that I will leave aside here, like approximation uh, theory, stability properties, and, and more. Um, so just a disclaimer uh, at the beginning, so we'll reduce to uh, learning linear networks. So what are linear networks? Well, these are simply functions of, of this form. So, well, you, you apply matrix W1 to X and then W2 and so on up to Wn. And of course, uh, this is just a linear function still. So it's, it's Wx, where Wx is, uh, W is the product of these, all these matrices. Um, these can have uh, different uh, dimensions. And um, well, usually in, in deep learning, these are probably not really the, the things we are using. But on the other hand, uh, we will look at um, op the optimization part and then optimizing such uh, deep linear networks is still non-trivial. And before passing to uh, non-linear networks, which are usually used, uh, I think one should first understand the linear part. Um, so the topic of this talk is uh, on the one hand, um, well, the theory for the gradient flow for training um, these networks. So we abstract from the uh, from the gradient descent to actually the gradient flow, and um, so we found that there is an associated Riemannian geometry um, to to this this flow. So in the end, we can identify the corresponding flow as a as a Riemannian gradient flow on a space of matrices of fixed rank. And so we introduce a new metric on that um, space. And then um, in the second part of the talk, I will talk about the implicit bias of gradient descent and um, revealing that actually this tends to promote low rank matrices. Um, and so the talk, this workshop is about tensors. So I will not really touch upon uh, tensors, except if you interpret a matrix as a order two tensor, well, not very interesting maybe, but um, I think, uh, well, if you're interested in tensors, I think you can think of extensions of, of, of what I talk about uh, to tensors, and then it would 
I think be interesting to to study the the corresponding problems also for the for the uh, tensor situation. So I hope I, I this well this will be interesting also for people who are um, mostly working on tensors. Okay, so uh, what is a deep neural network? I guess most of you have seen this before. Um, so it's simply um, a composition of several simple functions, these G1, G2, and so on. And these simple functions are called layers. And these layers are affine functions. Um, so Wj x plus Bj, where Wj is a certain matrix and Bj is a um, vector. And then uh, after this affine function, we apply a so-called activation function, which, which acts component-wise. So sigma is a, is a function from R to R that we apply to each component uh, of the resulting vector. And um, yeah, there are many um, choices uh, around, for instance, the well-known ReLU function, which is simply the maximum of, of zero and T, for instance. Um, so with a little trick, uh, while well, appending the data by, by a one and the last component and, and introducing this function and the matrix Wj, which looks like this, which actually has this vector Bj also in, in it, we can actually, uh, well, omit the vectors uh, Bj because then you get an equivalent situation. Oh, it's you. See, I thought it was, he, I thought it was, uh... Uh, okay. Okay, so, and then uh, we talk about uh, supervised learning. I, I think, I mean, this was already treated several times uh, uh -huh. in this, this workshop. So we have given input output pairs, and then we would like to find the parameters, which are the, these matrices of, of the neural network, such that we basically um, uh, fit the labels of these input data. So we want to find a function which maps the input to the, to the output. And um, of course, this should not only be, be like this for, for these training data, but uh, hopefully this generalizes then well to, to unseen data where we just get the input and would like to predict the output. Um, there's a second um, scenario, which is also um, important, which is unsupervised learning. So here you are just getting input data and you would like to uh, get some information on, on their structure. So a simple situation or a case is PCA. So there you would like to find a subspace, which roughly uh, well, approximately con contains the data, but you can do this also in a nonlinear fashion. And, and this is, um, uh, these are autoencoders, or it's one technique to do this. So you have an encoder, which maps from the input dimension to a dimension D, which is usually uh, smaller than the input dimension. And then there is a decoder, which maps back to the input dimension. So we, we take an input, which comes here, and then uh, the encoder generates a so-called code, and then we go back from this code to the output. And we would like to find neural networks G and H. These are the encoder and decoder such that if we put uh, in an XJ, we output XJ again. Um, just as a remark, the identity is not allowed because we reduce uh, dimension. So, um, and uh, so the idea is that that basically this G and H encodes the subspace, which, which, or actually a manifold, which, which contains the data. But if we actually choose linear function, this is basically a PCA because uh, these functions encode linear subspaces. Okay. Um, just an example of what autoencoders can do. So, um, these are actually images which are um, not images of true persons or existing persons. So these were generated by autoencoders. So what uh, what you do, you I mean, these are trained on uh, 
pictures of faces. And then at some point uh, when you want to generate new images, you basically just use the decoder and just input a random vector here. And then you get as output something like that. I, I find it quite remarkable. Of course, there are some tweaks here if you really want to produce it with that quality, but the basic principle is this. Um, okay, and now the question is, how do you actually adapt these, these neural networks um, to data? So this is done uh, via optimization. So you set up a so-called loss function which, uh, which should measure like something like distances. So if, if we input uh, xj to this, this function, then the distance or well, the similarity to yj should be as, yeah, as small as possible or the similarity as, as large as possible. And so you would like to um, find then a function which minimizes this, uh, empirical loss function over all data. So that's, that's the basic principle. And, um, and this also includes learning of an outer encoder by simply setting as F, um, well, the composition of two neural networks and, and for YJ, um, well, for, for YJ we simply set uh, equal to xj, and then this is also, um, well, modeling and autoencoder them. And so what is usually done is, is very, to, well, to actually solve that problem, um, well, especially in the large scale machine learning setup, you use gradient descent. So you initialize with some matrices, and then you, uh, you compute the gradient and take a direction towards the gradient, and this is this is your ups, uh, update. I mean, of course, there are many variants. Also, how to compute the the step size, and and in the stochastic part, you you don't compute the full gradient, but an approximation, and so on. But but this is the basic um, uh, method. And so the question is like, um, why does this converge in the setup, or where does it converge to? I mean, the point is that um, even if L itself is convex, uh, once you put a neural network, then in the parameters, this is highly non-convex. Okay, and well, before continuing, I, I would like to um, uh, talk quickly about, about some puzzling experiments that, that uh, were reported in this paper from 2007. And so usually uh, in, in these moder modern applications, you have much more network parameters than training data. And so in, in experiments, you often um, manage to get the training error to zero. So the, and then you're sure that you have reached the global minimum uh, because the loss function usually, well, the loss is usually uh, non-negative. And so if you reach, reach uh, zero loss, I mean, you reach the global minimum. And so the, the, the problem se doesn't seem to be that, that you get stuck in local minima, at least for these, well, when you have more network parameters than training data. And, um, and what they also observed is that the generalization error decreases with increasing number of parameters. And this was a surprise because usually you would say as a, from a traditional statistics viewpoint that you're in a regime of overfitting. At some point, you, I mean, you interpolate the data exactly. So you also somehow fit the noise, but, um, yeah, I mean, the more you increase and, and you're already above the number of uh, training data with the number of parameters. Um, so, so this is, yeah, the question is what's, what's happening here. Okay, and they, they also did a number of other experiments um, where they also always got training error zero. For instance, they, they put instead of the true labels, random labels. Of course, then um, 
this whole system doesn't uh, generalize very, very well anymore because if you just try to fit garbage, I mean, you don't expect that something useful comes out. They even try to um, fit, uh, well, data that is generated as Gaussian noise um, and you also get, get zero loss. So, um, um, and so, so this, um, well, with these experiments, they actually questioned whether, I mean, one has to rethink about classical statistical learning theory because you basically will get the same generalization error bounds uh, for this case with random labels or with the true labels. Um, at least if you measure Rademacher complexity in terms of like if you make a computation of this based on the number of parameters that you have in the network. Um, so I put really here because, I mean, I really think it's a way like actually um, the question is of what should you actually compute the Rademacher complexity? Um, so let me be precise a bit more. So if you have more network parameters than training data, um, oh, sorry, um, yeah, so, it, well, actually, one can even prove that in the overparameterized scenario, there are many networks interpolating the data if, if the number of uh, parameters is somewhat larger than the number of, of uh, training data. And so you will fill, fill, can find many global minimizers of, of the, the loss function. And then the question is, like, which loss function does the optimization find? And um, so we just run gradient descent, start somewhere. And, and so it seems that the used algorithm imposes some implicit bias towards certain uh, solutions. And, um, and then the question is, maybe we can answer this puzzle by, by asking or trying to answer whether the, the set of implicitly favored networks has small Rademacher complexity. So um, of course, it's also depending on, on like the data, like if you have these random labels, then you don't expect that the very simple network can fit this. So, I mean, you still find the network fitting it, but you expect that this would be much more complex than uh, for actual real data. And so maybe that answers a bit why uh, why this we get this observation. And actually we already saw in the talk of Furong Wang, uh, where she actually um, proposed some tensor decompositions of the, the matrices involved and, and um, appro could approximate the learned network using this. And then for these networks, you actually have um, nice Rademacher complexity bounds or generalization error bounds. Um, and so it seems that um, at least in their, in her experiments, actually the learning found a solution which can be very well approximated by some uh, solution of low complexity. Uh, but still the question is like, why does gradient descent favor this in the first place? Um, and so, it seems that understanding generalization error in deep learning requires understanding of the optimization algorithms that are used for the learning. And these are usually gradient descent or um, stochastic gradient descent and, and its variants. And um, for an analysis, it's also useful to first study the gradient flow because then you don't need to discuss depth sizes and, and so on. And so the question is, what is the implicit bias of these algorithms? Um, yeah, and, and so to study this, we look actually at linear neural networks or deep matrix factorization as already said. Um, I realize I need to speed up a little. So there, there are already some, some results, like here is some, some um, references. Um, but uh, let me, instead of going through these, let me just um, explain what, what we did. So as I already said, we look, look at these linear networks. And um, well, these may not be expressive enough for applications, but the convergence properties may still be non-trivial. 
And you may also view this, uh, like this factorization as an overparametrization of a given matrix. Um, observe that if um, these are, um, yeah, dj times dj minus one matrices, then the factorization has a rank which is at most the, the minimum of these dimensions. So you may actually explicitly introduce a low rank um, constraint by this factorization, but, but you don't have to um, if the dimensions are large. And also we consider a particular loss, namely the um, square loss. And then we can write the resulting uh, loss functional for, for W in, in this way. So we have a data matrix co collecting all the labels and X collecting all the input data. And so we, we have this simple function Y minus WX that we would like to minimize over W. And now um, instead of directly minimizing this, uh, we actually factorize the, the matrix we write as a, as a linear neural network. So we get this functional. And uh, well, in the special case of an autoencoder, we have also like, well, basically y is equal x. And so what we do now is, uh, oh, okay, first remark, so ln, uh, while L1 is convex, ln is not convex, at least not jointly in this tuple of matrices. So this is, well, somehow causing the, problems. And well, I mean, we would like to study the, the gradient descent, but let's first abstract to the gradient flow. So, I mean, we look at the, the, the gradient with respect to um, one of these uh, matrices and, and consider the, well, um, well, the flow which takes, well, goes towards the negative gradient. And well, we get a system of, of uh, equations because for each J we have one equation. And this is a continuous version of the gradient descent. And we can, in this case, also compute explicitly the, the, this gradient, which, which looks like this. Okay, and the question, the first question is, does the flow converge to a critical point, a local minimum or even a global minimum of LN? And to study this, we look at actually at the, at the um, product here. Um, so we look at the flow and then form the product again. And then we can derive an equation for the product, which looks like this. It's a bit complicated, but, but okay. So, um, and in the special case, the interesting thing is that um, we can actually reduce it to a, an equation which only acts on the, on the factorized matrix W. Namely, this is uh, happening if we have so-called balanced initial conditions. So we have this um, equation valid for all J. And then, then we actually get, get this, this equation which is governing the, the dynamics of the product matrix. And obviously this is different from just running the gradient descent on well, on L1 of one, well, of this, well, if we do not factorize. And so we, we studied a bit more in detail what, what this, this uh, operator here does. And so we introduce uh, this map AW of Z, where we simply replace here this gradient by, by Z. And in the case of balance initial condition, we can actually write the equation then, then like this. And, and so we can actually associate to, to this operator um, then a Riemannian metric as, as it turns out. So this determines the geometry of this flow. And so to formulate this, let us first look at the tangent space of the manifold of matrices of rank R, which, which has this um, nice form. And then uh, as a first step, we showed that if we restrict that operator that I just introduced to the tangent space, then it maps into the tangent space and it's self-adjoint and positive definite and in particular invertible. And then 
Um, so, so if you look at the restriction, it's, it's therefore invertible. And then we can introduce um, this uh, bilinear form depending on W. And um, we could show that this is defining a Riemannian metric on um, this manifold of matrices of class C1. Um, well, maybe it's even of higher smoothness, but so far we couldn't prove that. So we, we proved C1. And uh, we even have an explicit formula for, for this Riemannian metric, which is, looks a bit complicated given by an integral, but uh, okay, that's also what we, show, uh, we showed. And uh, having that, and um, while looking at the definition of a Riemannian gradient, well, the Riemannian gradient associated to that metric is precisely that operator applied to the standard gradient. Okay, and therefore, if we have balancedness and the initial point is in, in a set of uh, matrices of rank R, then we can recover the flow of this product as a Riemannian gradient flow on this set of matrices. Okay. Um, okay, now a question is uh, about convergence. And so the first result is um, about convergence to critical points. So if this matrix X, X transpose has full rank, so, I mean, if the data is random, this is, well, not really as a restriction. Um, <clears throat> and then it turns out that these flows are defined for all T and, um, this tuple converges to a <clears throat> to a, cr a critical point of Ln as t goes to infinity. So we we ensure convergence to a critical point, and um, well, the, the proof is based on uh, the theorem of Lyapunov, um, re which requires us to actually show bo boundedness of all these. Um, individual matrices, which is turned out to be a little bit tricky, but um, well, in the end we succeeded. Um, and well, the result also generalizes a previous uh, result, but uh, let me not go into details. And now the question is, um, well, a critical point could be a saddle point, a local minimum uh, and so on. So the question is, can we get convergence to the global minimizer? So first of all, it's a bit special about this functional that all local minima are automatically global. Um, it's non-convex, but still it has this property. Um, I mean, this is very special for this loss function, but, but I mean, um, yeah, the square loss is nice in all possible senses and also in this one. Um, but still we have actually saddle points. And so we need to ensure that we do not get stuck in a, in a saddle point. And uh, so we could show, I mean, it principle can happen because if you start in a saddle point, you will never move. It's a critical point. So the gradient is zero, uh, but it turned out that for almost all initial values, um, we basically have convergence to a global minimizer. So at least for N equals two, we could show this, um, uh, strictly uh, for n larger than th three, it's it's a conjecture. But what we could show is that at least we uh, converge to a critical point of L n such that the product is a global minimizer of L one restricted to the manifold of matrices of rank k, where now k can be anything between zero and the maximal possible rank that is allowed with this problem. So we conjecture that it's always the really the maximal rank, at least for almost all initialization. But uh, yeah, the proof method does not uh, give that, unfortunately. So for okay. just a reminder and, that uh, uh, your time is almost up. Uh, yeah, I realize. A couple more um, minutes. So um, yeah, I mean, we, we already also we are presently working on, on writing up this, the corresponding result for the gradient descent under suitable conditions on the step size. 
Okay, um, actually I had a second part, which uh, probably I spent too, too much time on the first part, but let me briefly say a bit on this. So, um, I, I, okay, I wanted to speak about this implicit bias and it turns out that in this situation, we get actually implicit bias towards low rank matrices. And so let's, let's in order to study this, look at this, uh, this problem where we want to recover a matrix of uh, small rank from linear measurements. So the matrix completion problem, if you wish. And for that problem, uh, we have like methods from compressive sensing basically to do that. Um, like uh, we minimize the norm, the nuclear norm subject to, to this constraint and, and the suitable conditions on A. And for instance, if M basically scales like the rank times N, we can recover this original low rank matrix. But now um, we want to approach this using a deep matrix factorization. So we set Z as uh, this product of N matrices and simply put up this loss function, the L2 loss of Y minus A applied to this product and then run gradient descent on this tuple. And you might say, well, if we choose the dimension such that there is automatically a rank constraint, then yeah, of course, also the solution should have low rank. But um, what we will do now, we do not make a constraint on, on the rank. So we take actually n by n matrices. And it turns out um, that, well, let's leave out the case n equals one. Um, that if you do numerical experiments and so try to recover a 20 by 20 matrix of rank two from Gaussian random measurements and run this uh, gradient descent on this low um, uh, on this loss function and use various values for the number of layers. Um, so then um, for instance, here is the curve for n equals four. So this means that Basically, with about 80 measurements, uh, we always recover the, the true matrix, uh, which lives in a dimension uh, in the space of dimension 400. So this is a bit remarkable because we did not put explicitly into this that we should want to recover a matrix of low rank. I mean, gradient descent tends to promote this. And uh, so, um, it's it's a bit surprising that that actually we get um, uh, get this phenomenon. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, my time is running up. So um, so um, I mean, there's there's previous work on this which also suggests this, but but um, um, so there's in my opinion not not yet a really convincing explanation or at least convincing theory for that and so we studied this pro problem for an estimation problem where, where basically we we could actually solve everything explicitly and and got an explanation for this so let me just give you one um further uh, experiment so so here the um take as a matrix, like a big data matrix, which contains as columns all like um, MNIST images, which show a one, and then uh, there's a lot of noise. And if we run like a gradient descent, basically with, with no factorization, so just one layer, then um, you basically only see, see noise if we uh, move here. And in the end, we can converge to the, the, to the given noisy image. But if we, start doing this with two or three layers, like here in the middle, we actually uh, see a denoised image, which is, I mean, this image is basically a column of this big data matrix. And this basically suggests that we have a, um, in the middle, we have a low rank approximation of this data matrix. And towards the end, we actually also recover the noise. And, and so, um, <clears throat> So if you observe the singular values um, for n, n equals one, then this just goes up, but like all the singular values go up simultaneously. And if we, for instance, look at the picture for n equals four, we see that like uh, in the beginning, all the singular values are small. And at some point, just the first one jumps up. 
And then at this point between, like in this time uh, interval, we get a rank one approximation. And then at this point, we get a rank two approximation and so on. So you see that, that the, and you see that the dynamics is such that we, we promote low rank on the, on the way. And so in, in the special case, we could actually solve explicitly these, these equations and, and could give a theory for, uh, for that, for this very simple initialization where we just um, initialize with alpha times the identity, all, all these, these matrices. Okay, but um, I think I'm, I'm way over time. So um, let me uh, skip all this and um, come to an end. Uh, yeah, so um, there are many open questions like I put this conjectures. Um, we, we would like to extend the analysis of the implicit bias. Um, well, we just analyzed the non-symmetric case, but of course, uh, and the, the one with the identical initialization, you would also look prove the, something for random initialization, also for the original motivating problem for matrix sensing, but all this is open. And I think what would be very interesting is to, to look at this also for tensor problems and see whether similar phenomenon happen here. And of course, the holy grail is to extend this to, to nonlinear networks. Okay, that's all from my side. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs>